Chapter 4. Modern Anti-Zionism is Rooted in Classic Anti-Semitism. The origins of today's anti-Zionism are indistinguishable from anti-Semitism. While modern anti-Semites take care not to say anything reminiscent of classic anti-Semitism, a direct line connects them. Their attempt to distance themselves from their Jew-hating origins is a smokescreen, not reality. All the main strains of anti-Zionism since modern Zionism began emerged from classic anti-Semitism. Right-wing anti-Semites were, and are, naturally anti-Zionist. Hitler's Mein Kampf contained a number of anti-Zionist passages, such as, quote, When Zionism tries to convince the world that the racial self-determination of the Jew would be satisfied with the creation of their own state in Palestine, the Jews are once again craftily pulling the wool over the eyes of the stupid Goyim. They never intended to build a Jewish state in Palestine, not for the purpose of living in it anyway. They just want an organization headquarters for their international swindling and cheating with its own political power that is beyond the reach and interference from other states. It would be a refuge for crooks who were exposed and a college for future swindlers. End quote. Modern neo-Nazis liberally quote left-wing anti-Zionist sites such as Electronic Intifada and Mondo Weiss. Their hate for Jews animates their hate for Israel. They see no distinction between their anti-Zionism and their anti-Semitism. Today's Jewish anti-Zionism is nearly all socialist anti-Zionism, the most prevalent kind in the West today. It has purely anti-Semitic origins. Anti-Zionist literature from behind the Iron Curtain was transparently anti-Semitic from the 1950s through the 1970s. Here is a passage from the State of Israel, Its Position and Policies, printed by the Soviet State Publishing House in 1958. Quote, the Zionist movement represents a form of the nationalistic ideology of the rich Jewish bourgeoisie, intimately tied to imperialism and to colonial oppression of the people of Asia. Zionism has tied itself to American and other Western capitalism and, with Jewish terrorist tactics, attacked its Arab neighbors, the National Liberation Movement of the People of the Middle East, spearheaded by its native leaders, such as President Nasser, King Ibn Saud of Saudi Arabia, and King Iman Ahmed of Yemen, is constantly threatened by naked Jewish aggression. The clear duty of all Marxists and communists in this situation is to help the Asian and African people crush the reactionary Jewish forces." End quote. By the 1970s, Soviet anti-Semitism was more circumspect and much more closely aligned with today's left-wing anti-Zionism. It still didn't fool anyone. Vladimir Y. Begun's Invasion Without Arms, published in 1977 by the publishing house of the Young Communist League, included these quotes. Quote, As before, today too, the Zionists cooperate even with rabid anti-Semites, former fascists, thugs, and stokers of the Nazi crematoria. The Israel that has been created by the Zionists is a predatory octopus whose tentacles, the Zionist organizations, have enmeshed half the world and suck out the sap of life from various countries, that is, millions in funds created by the labor of workers and peasants. The bourgeois press of a number of capitalist countries in Europe and in America at present is full of Zionist agents and is bribed by Zionist money and defends Zionist interests, end quote. We see a change in the tone of socialist anti-Semitism over the last seven decades, but the underlying philosophy contains just as much pure hatred of Jews as ever. They hide it better, but that doesn't mean that they aren't just as virulently anti-Semitic as before. It is telling that very little literature from the left today criticizes the more blatant anti-Semitism of their philosophical forebears, which shows that they aren't really against anti-Semitism as they claim. Their core arguments against Zionism have not changed since the 1950s, just what they choose to emphasize. The other major strain of anti-Zionism today is Arab anti-Zionism, likewise rooted in old-fashioned anti-Semitism. Arab opposition to Zionism grew from the disgust at Jews looked upon as weak, pathetic, second-class citizens and dimmies in the Arab world, rising and taking political power in controlling land in the Middle East. 
Arabs accepted non-Arab Ottomans controlling the region. They opposed European control, but were generally able to accept it as a de facto admission that Christian Europe was too powerful to oppose. But Jews? Wholly unacceptable. They were supposed to be obedient, controlled minorities who had little recourse when Arabs attacked them. It is absurd to separate Arab anti-Zionism from anti-Semitism. Jordan banned Jews, not Zionists, not Israelis, but Jews, from visiting any Jewish holy sites in the West Bank and Jerusalem the entire time Jordan controlled them. This is hardly the only example. Anti-Semitism was so entwined with Arab anti-Zionism in the 1950s and 1960s that no one took seriously the occasional Arab objections that they didn't hate Jews. Here is a summary of a small sample of official anti-Semitic propaganda broadcast to the Arab world in 1961. This description is quoted from Yitzhak Aron's Middle East Record, written in 1961, and he says, The UAR state-owned radio and press, but not the president, condemned not only Israel and Zionism, but also Judaism, which, in the image of European anti-Semitism, they depicted as a satanic force. The notorious Protocols of the Elders of Zion, fabricated by the Tsarist Secret Service at the beginning of the century and serving ever since as a cornerstone for anti-Semitic literature, was alleged by Cairo spokesmen to constitute the secret protocols of the First Zionist Congress. They were translated in the UAR, as were also what Cairo papers are alleged to be the sections from the Talmud, such as assuring paradise to the Jew who killed a non-Jew. Ahmed Said, the director of the Cairo Voice of the Arabs broadcasts, devoted a series of talks to the Jewish story throughout the world. The Jews, he said, had a traditional solidarity and a hostility to all that was non-Jewish. This went back to rabbinical precepts, which had urged them to disregard all moral considerations in their pursuit of riches. Jews had always been skilled in imposing conditions on the countries and peoples among them whom they lived. During wars, they welcomed invaders and had themselves caused many wars. That's the end of the quote. They attempted no distinction between Jews and Zionists. Only in response to Western distaste at the obvious Jew hatred did Arab nations and the Soviets start to tone down that part of their hate in public. But the history of Arab and socialist anti-Zionism shows that they are based on Jew hatred. The proof is obvious. Neither today's Arab anti-Zionists nor the socialist anti-Zionists will condemn the anti-Semitism of their predecessors. Anti-Semitism is inherent to those philosophies. Today's apologetics and insistence that they are not anti-Semitic don't change that. Chapter 5. Anti-Zionism merely the latest flavor of Jew hatred. Hatred for Israel is indeed a form of anti-Semitism. Just because it is not exactly the same as previous incarnations of anti-Semitism doesn't mean it isn't fundamentally the same thing. There have been plenty of flavors of anti-Semitism through history. They all differ from one another. The targets are never identical to the previous targets. There are virtually always good Jews to whom the anti-Semites point as proof that they aren't bigots. Here's a quick history. Ancient Greek anti-Semitism, which was ridiculing the religion, anger at Jews for being separate, was not the same as Hellenistic anti-Semitism. Hellenistic anti-Semitism, that the first diaspora was a conspiracy against humankind, was not the same as ancient Roman anti-Semitism. Ancient Roman anti-Semitism, which was persecuting Jews for practicing Judaism and not assimilating, was not the same as early Christian anti-Semitism. Early Christian anti-Semitism, where they referred to Jews as Christ killers and the many anti-Semitic passages in the New Testament, is not the same as Islamic anti-Semitism. Islamic anti-Semitism, saying that Jews are deceitful and murderers of prophets, is not the same as medieval European anti-Semitism. Medieval European anti-Semitism, the Crusades, Jews as scapegoats for epidemics, the blood libel, the Inquisition, is not the same as Lutheran Reformation anti-Semitism. Lutheran anti-Semitism, which were direct calls to pogroms, accusations of blasphemy, is not the same as philosophical anti-Semitism. Philosophical anti-Semitism, symbolized by Voltaire, saying it's that the Jews are an ignorant and barbarous people, was not the same as socialist anti-Semitism. 
Socialist anti-Semitism, saying that Jews are the corrupting force behind capitalism, is not the same as racial anti-Semitism. Racial anti-Semitism, saying that Jews are an inferior race, is not the same as conspiracy theory anti-Semitism. Conspiracy theory anti-Semitism, saying that Jews secretly control the world, the media, and the banks, is not the same as modern anti-Semitism anti-Zionism. Modern anti-Semitism says Jews do not have the right to a state and that the Jewish state is uniquely evil. The hate that animates this is the same as for all the other flavors of anti-Semitism. Just because it is called anti-Zionism doesn't mean it is not anti-Semitism. It is simply the newest manifestation. As in previous anti-Semitisms, there are always reasons to hate Jews. The reasons are invariably garbage, but the excuses have a function, which is to have something on which to hang hatred of Jews and not feel like a bigot. Anti-Zionism is identical. As in the previous anti-Semitisms, the set of people who support it are not the same set of people who supported the previous types, just as Nazi anti-Semites had little in common with communist anti-Semites. The older anti-Semitism types are still around, but somehow people manage to come up with new types all the time, and the new versions add new excuses and new audiences. The Enlightenment should have destroyed anti-Semitism, since it was supposedly objective. But philosophy and science served as excuses and justifications for Jew hatred. It showed that even people who claim to be objective can be haters. Today, people who claim to oppose bigotry use the same kind of flawed logic to tell people to hate most Jews. They find that they must remove Jews from victimhood status to treat them as the victimizers. Today's anti-Semitism relies on excuses that blame Israel for the world's troubles, just as the previous one blamed Jews for the world's troubles. Under both Christian and Muslim rule, Jews would be told that they must renounce Judaism to get rid of the stigma of being Jewish. Today, Jews are told that they must renounce Zionism to be accepted as full members of certain groups. All these versions of anti-Semitism are based on the same hate of Jews, and justifications for that hatred are made up afterwards. The hate is the common denominator. No one can seriously say today's rabid hate for Israel exists for any other nation, just as no one can say that the age-old hate for Jews has been matched by the hate for any other people over history. There is nothing more acceptable about today's anti-Zionism than about the anti-Semitism of old. But just as with the previous ones, the modern anti-Semites strenuously argue that their anti-Semitism is justified. Modern anti-Semites argue that they are only criticizing a state, and that there's nothing anti-Semitic about that. It is unfair, they say, to lump them in with the reprehensible previous types of anti-Semites. The argument is disingenuous because what the modern anti-Zionists display is not criticism, but hate. Some examples of anti-Zionist activity on campus, specifically the University of California system, and all of these are occurring between 2014 and 2016, demonstrate this. This is a quote from the AMCHA initiative from 2016. And these are all examples that happened at the University of California. A male member of the SJP at the UC San Diego recognized a fellow female Jewish student and followed and harassed her. The female student reported, they followed me, calling my name, yelling that I was a racist Zionist cow. I have never felt so unsafe in my life. I didn't know anyone would put me in danger. This problem is way more serious than I had imagined. At UC Davis, swastikas were spray painted on a Jewish fraternity days after fraternity brothers spoke against divesting from Israel. At UC Berkeley, Zionists should be sent to the gas chamber was scrolled on a bathroom wall in the wake of a student senate campaign to pressure the university to divest from American companies that do business with Israel. At UCLA, Hitler did nothing wrong was carved into school property after a contentious BDS campaign. At UC Davis, Grout Out the Jews was scrolled on the university's Hillel House following a heated BDS debate. At UC Santa Barbara, stereotypical and demonizing statements of Jews were made during a divestment resolution vote. One student explained, I am disgusted by the normalization of anti-Semitic language so casually thrown about at the divestment meeting. In those eight hours, I was told that Jews control the government, that all Jews are rich, that Zionism is racism, that the marginalization of Jewish students is justified because it prevents the marginalization of other minority groups. 
at UC Santa Barbara. Flyers blaming Israelis and all Jews for 9-11 were posted on campus. At UCLA, a Jewish student running for office was questioned about her eligibility by anti-Israel activists simply because of her religion. Also at UCLA, campus activists led a pledge drive to keep Jewish students known to support Israel from serving on the student government. End of the quote from Amacha. This is hate speech, with noble anti-Zionist goals as cover. Anytime anti-Israel activity crosses the line into hate, it must be deemed as offensive as hate speech against any other group. The hate for Zionist positions is no less reprehensible than hate against blacks or gays on campus and deserves the same treatment. If pro-Tibetan activists were followed, harassed, and cursed routinely as they went about their day on campus, and anti-Tibetan graffiti scrolled on areas where they gather, I don't think anyone would disagree that they are victims of hate. However, only one group is subjected to hate for their political beliefs, and those are the people who openly support the state of Israel. The hate is no less odious, and this is only because Israel is the Jewish state. There are other differences between anti-Israel hate speech and valid political discourse about realizing other groups' nationalist ambitions. One is that Israel already exists. Alone among all nations, it is criticized for its very being. Anti-Zionists love to observe that there are plenty of anti-Zionist Jews before the state of Israel was established as proof that they cannot be anti-Semitic. However, before Israel was reborn, the question was theoretical. Once the Jewish state exists, the discussion revolves around dismantling one state among all the nations on earth. Valid criticism of Israel is legitimate, but deeming it uniquely evil and deserving destruction betrays but that the motive is not justice, but hate. Justice apparently demands dismantling no other state. Finally, evidence that hate and not legitimate critique motivates the anti-Israel activists comes from how they treat pro-Israel speech on campus and elsewhere. Instead of a debate or allowing a multiplicity of views, they do everything they can to shut down free speech rights of Zionists. Speakers get shouted down, even threatened, and students who want to hear them face harassment. The BDS movement deems it beyond the pale to have any interactions with proud Israelis. Their intolerance makes them intolerable. Anti-Zionist theorists write poetic articles that describe how the destruction of the Jewish state is a moral, noble goal. One might also craft a reasonable sounding argument to support a return to slavery. One can find well-written pro-slavery arguments in newspapers from the Civil War era. But everyone understands the most soaring pro-slavery rhetoric was just a cover for racist hate. The fact that there is a theoretical way to express anti-Zionist opinions without crossing over into hate speech is wonderful, but it isn't the reality, and it cannot be used to support the continuous hate that Zionist Jews experience on campus under the cover of free speech. That hate is indistinguishable from the traditional hate for Jews.